Hey everyone and welcome back to our weekly live streams where we're looking at the RISC-V platform and we're trying to bring forth the Orboot firmware project to the Vision 5 board which is based on a JH7100 SoC. Now today um, you see none of that actually on the screen now um, because we're going to have a look at a different level. So what you see here and uh, let me introduce, if you don't know it yet, um, is one new logo just below me there. So right below me are a few stars, and just below the stars you see a whale. And that whale is named Moby, and Moby is the mascot of the Docker project, which you might already know because it's a very commonly used tool uh, for creating something like containers on the Linux platform. And it's been developed so far now uh, that it's become very, very convenient and, you know, used by many, many software developers uh, to get a very, very familiar environment to run their software in, uh, either for development, but also to actually roll out software. So um, there is one repository that you can see here, uh, which I just opened an issue for today. Uh, as you can see, it's been just uh, eight hours since then. Um, and here I'm asking if we could add some notes on bringing up Docker over CPU, the tool that we already took a look at last week, uh, which is just like Docker, actually written in Go. Well, at least our implementation is, right? Um, yeah, but before we dive too deep into this, um, I actually want to have a brief look at some news that I have for you. So. Uh, Let's look at this here, which already says good news up here. Um, so there was some announcements on the RISC-V um, well, community here in a, in a Google group for the developer program from which I got the uh, Vision 5 board. And uh, the discussion here is on the next SOC, not JH7100, but JH7110. Um, and I was asking if there would be good documentation on that. Uh, uh, well, I was also telling that, um, well, we were getting a bit stuck on the JH7100 due to lack of documentation. So um, Jeff, who is uh, running the community over here, has actually uh, been very, very friendly and offered us to relay some questions that we have and some, uh, you know, things we could ask for uh, to Vision 5. And so I wrote a few things down here. Uh, which, by the way, he has already forwarded. I hadn't gotten around to it earlier and just uh, pushed it out today. Um, anyway, so the notes here, maybe let's zoom in a bit because it's hard to read otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I uh, wrote some notes like on the manual, for example. So we saw in the manual um, of the various uh, different RISC-V cores that are out there. Uh, there is one called U7, U74, U74MC. And yeah, it was a bit hard to figure out which one is which. And um, then we also saw something called Vic uh, in the JH7100 docs repository. Um, and I took another look at this again. Um, there is this Vic U7 manual. And I now assume that this is the actual core that we're running on. Or, well, it's actually the SOC, if you will. and. Even here in the manual, it's described as uh, two cores, so two U7 cores. Um, yeah, but as you can see, I'm already struggling to describe it yet again. Um, so yeah, I was asking if this here is the actually right manual. And if so, that would help us because they also have the memory map in here. Um, yeah, so hopefully uh, <laughs> we get this right this time. So if you recall one of the previous streams, I was looking at the memory maps of the various other uh, documents that we could find. Um, and they all looked a bit different, uh, also compared to the JH7100 itself. So the SOC is uh, essentially, um, if you will, a superset of the uh, core, right? So within the SOC, you have the core, and then around that you have the peripherals, and then you have some buses interconnecting everything. Um, so that's sort of uh, how an SOC works um, in a very, very simplistic way. Now the uh, question was, you know, which is the actual um, core? So yeah, 
Oh, we get an answer to this now. Um, then uh, DRAM Forever has actually uh, figured out quite a lot of stuff and posted in the RV space forum here um, regarding uh, the JTAG debugging setup. So if you remember, we have lots of pins and there were also some unpopulated pins um, on the board. So the, uh, let's say, regular pins that you also know from uh, other boards like the Raspberry Pi and so on, um, there is just this 40 pin header. Uh, then there was a debug header, like a three pin header for UART, which you could also configure to pop up on uh, <laughs> other pins again. And then there is this unpopulated, I don't know, seven pin header or something, could also be eight, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, anyway, and those can also be, by the way, configured to jump to other pins again. So um, yeah, it was a bit confusing. Um, so hopefully we will uh, get some details on that and maybe also get OpenOCD running on it. And then we can debug our code with GDB, uh, the GNU debugger. Um, yeah, I've actually never done this really. Um, only in like a uh, virtual platform. So I was using uh, QMU and attached GDB to it. Uh, I tried OpenOCD a few times, but on a platform where it's actually not even supported uh, because protocols are different and so on. So yeah, that was also a bit weird. Um, maybe this would be a good time to uh, actually do this uh, for once. Yeah, regarding the uh, GPIO configuration, so we were struggling and uh, DRAM Forever, once again, uh, actually figured out uh, what is what. And so, yeah, we had this uh, function that we needed to call to put the UART pins um, from the debug header to the other header, um, which is actually nice. So, uh, because the, uh, the math drum is starting with a different baud rate, and switching baud rates uh, during the boot process is a bit, um, yeah, let's say not very uh, sensible to do. Uh, so attaching two USB serial devices was very helpful there, right? So on, on the one uh, that we could debug with, uh, we could do like um, flashing some uh, new initial uh, small blob. And then when we ran it, we could actually switch to the other uh, and see the output there. Anyway, yeah. Um, in the data sheet, we couldn't really find much documentation. There is uh, there is various places where they mention the IO pad share select something. Um, turns out I grabbed for this. Uh, this is a, uh, well, it's the name of a register and I could find it in the Linux kernel source code, right? So we also had that. We are already running Linux uh, on this device now. Um, but yeah, it's not actually documented. So yeah, you know, if, if you need to like um, look at actual implementations, um, yeah, that, that's not really documentation, right? So yeah, and it's also not very uh, developer friendly to be honest. So, you know, if you need to familiarize yourself now with uh, three different other projects, like, or in this case, even four. So, we, you know, we have Linux, the large kernel, which is really large. It's lots of thousands, if not millions of lines of code. Um, then the U-Boot project, uh, where you know there is also some special implementation, maybe in their OpenSBI fork as well. Um, and then there is the, uh, they call it second boot, right? So this is also a specific code again. Well, and technically we have another one, which is for, and this is the last point here, um, DRAM. So the DRAM controller, uh, when I looked at the source code, is just, you know, addressed by writing lots of strange values into registers, but there is no documentation on that actually. It's really just register, I don't know, one, two, three, write the value, I don't know what. Um, so yeah, we, we couldn't really make sense of that. So yeah, I, I didn't even talk much about it here in the stream. Um, I hope we can get back to that because um, I actually did this on a different platform. So we have the all winner D1 SOC that is also part of the um, program. So uh, yeah, there were uh, different development boards available and I already had a bunch of D1s. So I thought, okay, let's uh, <laughs> pick another one for a change. Um, and we actually wanted to extend Orboot uh, to many different platforms anyway, right? It doesn't really make sense to only have one or two. Um, so yeah, I did that. And for uh, the D1, I translated the uh, DRAM init code um, 
which um, was actually surprisingly, I wouldn't say particularly easy, uh, but comprehensible to do because we had an assembly dump from the vendor. So there was, you know, like assembly instructions, but you, you could say it's like annotations, if you will. Um, and so it looked cert, uh, sort of like the compiled code, to be honest. And then somebody translated that to C and I took it again and translated it to the best programming language out there, which is, of course, Rust. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was a huge success actually. Um, and we just uh, fixed a small issue recently and now we're able to fully boot up the platform within just five seconds. And you know, if I just want to run CPU in it, just takes another second or two um, and then I have it running. So I have a few boards like uh, this one here, for example, this is the Lychee D1 Doc Pro from Cyped. Um, yeah, let's have a brief look. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not uh, um, too easy to look at everything right here now, but it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so the nice part is I can now take this thing, I can attach it to my USB port and I can just run any code I want on it because it directly boots into CPU D. So the CPU daemon, right? So if you're asking like, you know, how do I get a RISC V CPU? I would just tell you, you take this. And if you ask me how to use it, I will say, I'll just plug it into your USB port and then you can run CPU and run your code on it. That's all. And that's exactly what we're also going to do today again. Um, so we had already done that last time. Um, but we're going to take it to another level. Um, anyway, to round this up here, um, the documentation that we could get um, can just be added to our repository here, right? So in Orboot, we have this data sheets repository where you can just file a pull request. If you have a data sheet, if you're a vendor, um, you can just put it in here. And when you implement Orboot for your platform, you know, then you can also just easily reference your manual and so on. And then everything is just nicely documented. And of course, because we're in the Rust ecosystem, we can also leverage the very, very nice modularity there. So unlike in C, you know, where you just have like uh, the, the sense of shared libraries, which are, um, you know, a, a bit harder to uh, work with, let's say, um, we actually have the so-called crates. So these are essentially like modules, if you know them from uh, other um, from other programming languages. And there is this thing here called a pack in Rust. That's peripheral access crate. So it's yeah, it's not anything really special. It's just um, a name for uh, a crate which has um, a description of hardware peripheral. So that comes from the Rust Embedded Working Group, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just an idea. It's not anything specific to the Rust crate itself. You know, it's, uh, it's really just about like what you typically find in there. Um, yeah, so if you take an SVD file, so that's uh, what many vendors actually have. SVD is a hardware description. Um, it's machine processable, so you can just translate that into one of these pack crates, right? So you just take your SVD file and then there is a tool which is called SVD to uh, pack or SVT to RS, I, I forgot the name to be honest. Um, and then we'll just generate this for you and you're already done. So if you already have this SVD file, it's not even much to do for you. It just takes like a few minutes to spin this up. You can publish everything and you're done. And now every developer can just take and use it right away. They can write their own bare metal programs and applications with it or, you know, you can uh, use it to contribute your Orboot implementation. So yeah, uh, Jeff had already uh, replied, as I said, and relayed the information to uh, Star5. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting an answer here. Okay, so let's close this for now. Um, also that thing. So yeah, one thing I wanted to look at today is Docker over CPU, right? So yeah, I felt this issue here. Let's have a a uh, very brief look maybe at what this repository is about anyway. Um, so it's, it's called RISC-V Bring Up. Um, it says RISC-V journey through containers and new projects. So yeah, containers, when you tell people about containers today, they immediately think about frequently Docker, 
um, right? So, yeah. Uh, so you naturally find a bunch of things here. Um, also, uh, around the Go programming language, just because it's very easy and convenient to write programs in Go, uh, also just compile them for other platforms, right? Um, they reference the uh, High Five Unleashed, so that's another uh, development board. Uh, I don't have one, but I think uh, quite a few people still have them. Um, yeah, they also mention virtual machines and so on. Um, and eventually, uh, yeah, here it comes to Docker and then other utilities around containers like Podman and so on. So yeah, or Kubernetes. So you know, if you're running this in production, you might be familiar with it, or if you've played with it already. Um, though we're not going to uh, go too much into detail there today. Uh, we're just going to look at a few things. So yeah, anyway, this here is a very, very large and comprehensive file now. Uh, <laughs> you can see the scroll bar here, right? So it's really a bunch of pages to read. Um, so yeah, I felt this issue and I will maybe contribute some notes on running Docker over CPU. Um, and I've already prepared that for today. So uh, we're going to do this in practice and I will push this also to a repository. So yeah, I was thinking about creating a new one, uh, but then it came to me that, well, <laughs> we already have something um, in the uh, uroot uh, org on GitHub. We have the CPU reposit uh, repository itself, right? Um, but in addition, we also have the uroot slash CPU binaries repository. Um, so here, if you want to read up on uh, CPU and or you know just uh, do a bit of a hands-on, uh, you can take a look at this here. Um, and yeah, so we have one directory here uh, for actually running it on Risk Five, and you don't even need real hardware for it. So this here is for a virtual machine. It runs in QMU. Um, yeah, there is a script on QMU and, you know, a short readme on how this works. Um, and we're going to do something similar today. So, yeah, we'll uh, spin this up in a bit. Um, and, yeah, hopefully we can contribute this back to this repository. Otherwise, you know, we'll just keep it in CPU binaries. Anyway, so, yeah, let's very briefly talk about Docker. So most people... Um, if they want to run something with Docker, they would either just type the Docker command and say Docker is some, run something. Um, so that would uh, typically pull an image from a registry where you find Docker images. Uh, or they would write a Docker file, like in this case here, and then they would build their own image and derive it from another one. However, of course, there has to be a starting point, right? So if you want to create an initial image, you would say from scratch here. Otherwise, you would say like from, I don't know, Debian something, right? If you want to derive from Debian. Um, yeah, in, the, in this case, uh, this is done from scratch and I have done something similar. So what, what they did here was, you know, uh, something similar to a Hello World program and they just call it Echo Risk 5. Um, they're exposing a port here. I'm not exactly sure why I guess it's something web-based and then run the single binary. And because it's written in Go, it's just everything compiled statically. There needs to be nothing else literally in this container. So um, this container here is essentially one binary just wrapped up a bit. And so what I did was a, a bit further um, I also put CPU in there and we will have a look at that now. So, um, yeah, uh, I have this here again, if you recall it from last time. So this is now the, uh, the center tool that we're using from Harvey from which we're booting our uh, CPU D image um, on the Vision 5. So uh, this is up and running now. This has been loaded from here. And so what we can do now, and we already did this um, last time, we can run our Hello World application that we've written in Rust, right? So, yeah, we have this. Uh, let me let me quickly maybe show the code. Um, now we're just, uh, yeah, I would just commit this here. So this is uh, some work in progress stuff. Um, whatever, I can just call it work in progress. And we check out the main branch again. 
main. So yeah, the main.rs file is very, very simple. Uh, we're not doing much. There are a few uh, switches up here, which are to um, you know run architecture specific co uh, code. Uh, and, and it's really, really simple. So, you know, we're just printing the name of the architecture uh, here in this nice string. And then we read out a few things like the CPU, right? So we uh, read from proxy view info, uh, we read the memory information and the command line that we're running as well as the kernel, right? So we're using the uname um, and then just printing it. So we can run this. We can just say, I, I've already compiled this, so I don't have to do it again. So we use CPU, the CPU command. Um, we're using our namespace, just our home directory, uh, our key that we're using for it. I always you know, like to provide a small uh, timeout here, especially if uh, I have these like less powerful platforms, let's say, or it's something uh, you know attached via uh, via like here it's a USB hub and behind that there is an adapter and you know behind that is the actual Ethernet. So yeah, just to be safe. Um, yeah, then we take the host name of our CPU and then the command that we want to run. So yeah, when we do this, just, you know, <laughs> takes a while. Oh, and it actually didn't work. So why didn't it work? Um, yeah, because I didn't write the right host name. Of course I didn't. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this is now the vision five, sorry. This here was the address I was using for the D1. Um, yeah, fun fact, D1 hexadecimal is 209 in decimal, hence the address. Anyway, so yeah, here we have our two sci-fi U74 cores or maybe U7 or U74 MC, uh, the thing we were a bit unsure about. Um, yeah, that's what's running on there. It's a 519 Linux kernel and it's the RISC-V architecture. Okay, so um, now we want to run a Docker image. So how do we get a Docker image? So I just described you how we can um, build our own from scratch, right? And I did this. So let me quickly show you my Docker file here. Um, yeah, I, I put some annotations on this. There is also something currently a bit misleading I need to fix up, but yeah, never mind too much right now. So we're deriving a Docker image from scratch. Um, we have a few arguments here and the arguments are, well, first of all, the command that we run because in, um, you know, in, in CPU, we can just run any command that we want technically, right? Um, yeah, then the key that we want to use. So yeah, we'll just, um, you know, for the sake of the example, copy that into the uh, image now. Um, then we have the, uh, CPU that we want to target. So this will be essentially the host name. Um, and I will show you later. So I will pass this as an argument when running Docker uh, or well, actually as an environment variable. So I will just overwrite this. This here is just a default. So that would be a host name. And technically this wouldn't currently even work because it doesn't resolve to anything. <laughs> um, yeah, then here is the architecture. Uh, that's part of uh, what I want to clean up a bit. So. Yeah, technically with CPU, we can just target any arbitrary architecture, right? We just need to cross compile. Uh, and then depending on how we compose our namespace, you know, we can just put everything side by side or, you know, compose our namespace in various ways. Um, yeah, so currently I'm just saying the CPU namespace is slash bin um, for convenience. Now there is one thing I had to copy in here and that's the C library uh, and also the LD. Um, that's a bit unfortunate, uh, but that's due to uh, CPU currently not being uh, fully statically compiled. It's dynamically linked. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why yet. I have some suspi uh, suspicions, but yeah, it's actually also not important here currently because it's sort of like a demo. Um, but now comes the actual interesting part. So we're copying over our applications. And so I made a small Hello World application that we're also going to take a look at, right? So I would just copy that into the container and then copy our key over uh, and a small shell script that I wrote to um, you know, run the lengthy CPU command that I was uh, running just before. So we can have a quick look at the cpu.sh script. It's really just that simple, right? So yeah, I'm 
printing again the CPU namespace and the command that we're going to run, uh, you know, for convenience. Um, and then we just call CPU again, uh, passing down our key, our namespace, uh, the timeout, and then the host, like the CPU that we want to use and our command again. And that's already it. So yeah, this is really just like when I run CPU here, right? Uh, yeah, usually like this. Anyway, so um, now let's have a quick look at the Go program that we have. So we have a main.go here. That's really not uh, fancy by any means. We're just uh, reading the two runtime variables. So there is OS and ARC, the architecture. And then we're just saying, hello, I am the OS on the architecture. And that's it. So I could, you know, I could just go build this, right? So I could say go build dash O, uh, what do we call it? Uh, I would just call it hello x86 because it's now uh, for my host. I'm not passing a go arc, which I would do otherwise to cross compile. Um, so when I say hello x86, we're seeing hello, I'm Linux on AMD64. Now comes the fun part because I have set it up that way. I could also run dot slash hello, even though it's compiled for risk five. So yeah, you can see here it's statically linked and it's a 64-bit RISC-V executable for Linux. And it says, hello, I'm Linux on RISC-V 64. Um, but yeah, this is really just a um, QMU user space emulation. So yeah, that's why it looks like it's on RISC-V. Um, it's actually not. So it, it's really just emulated here on my host. Okay, but now we want the real deal, right? So I wrote another convenience file for that. It's a simple make file. Um, I have my target CPU up here. So yeah, when, when I say CPU, we're really just talking about a host name, which is running the CPU daemon. And we're really literally using it as if it were just a CPU that we could just take and then now we just run our code on that. Um, so that's what we're also practically doing. So we can just say, hey, we're running something on a CPU here. Um, yeah, there is uh, a few targets that we need to look at. Um, this here prepare is about co uh, copying the shared libraries. Uh, let's ignore that for now. The interesting part is, so first I built the hello tool. I'm passing go arc equals risk 564. So what I just uh, told you, I would need to do to cross compile. Um, there is a run command. So run just just docker run then we're passing the target CPU. So the target CPU is the host name here. Um, and yeah, this here would be the container name. Um, and then we have the Docker target. So when I say uh, make Docker, it will build from the current directory a, um, a tag hello RV. So a tag in Docker is essentially like an alias for the image we're building. So yeah, we can just reference it easily. So here the tag becomes hello RV and you know, I can just pick it up here to uh, actually run it then. So yeah, the first thing is we're building the uh, Go tool, the hello, uh, the hello program. Um, then we're building the Docker image where we you know, the copy in the hello tool or, or hello program um, and then we run it. So what I'm now going to do is I will say sudo uh, that's because I just installed Docker today and I hadn't yet rebooted. Um, <laughs> that's a bit of a hack, if you will. So I'm saying sudo dash u, my own username again, and then make. Why do I do this? Because then I have my new groups. So if I look at my current groups, I'm not yet in the Docker group, so I couldn't just use anything with Docker, right? So I would need to escalate privileges in a way. How do we escalate privileges? We type sudo. Um, but if we just use our own username again, uh, we just inherit the new environment that's set up for us. So when I say uh, sudo dash u, my username groups, you see there is now also Docker behind it. Yeah, it's a handy trick. If you know otherwise people tell you to reboot or log in again or something, you don't actually need that. Um, so yeah, I will just sudo dash u 
uh, blah de blah and run make. So with make, we're running all the targets up here. So the, the first target by convention is just uh, what is being run. Doesn't even have to be called all, it can also be something else. So we're gonna run hello docker and run. And let's do so. It's actually rather quick. And here you already see the output. We're saying, hello, I'm Linux on RIS 564. Okay, so um, now I could have made up all of this, right? So instead of um, doing what we did here, uh, let's actually change our Go file a bit. Um, and what could we do to prove that we're truly running on the remote system there? Um, we could, just like with the Rust program, uh, we could just read out the file slash proc slash CPU info, right? So how do we do this? Um, we're going to need the OS module, right? And then we're going to Google us something uh, like Golang, Golang read file. Because nobody remembers anything today. We just Google everything and then copy, uh, copy paste. Um, fortunately, there is go by example.com, so we can just copy from there. Uh, OS dot read file. Excellent. Uh, check error. Well, who cares about error handling? So we're going to do this here. Uh, let's just paste this in here. So yeah, uh, what, whatever we call this. What do we call this? Uh, we say, let's call it CPU. Uh, this will be ignored. We're going to read slash proc slash CPU info. We don't check for errors. Uh, we're going to fmt.printf. Um, and instead of that, we just say CPU. And our string is... Um, actually, we can just do this. Ah, good example. You can just blindly copy paste things today. So yeah, um, we're just gonna print F. So why does it say read file? What? Uh, OS dot read file undefined type string has no field or method read file. What? Okay, what's wrong here? So it says OS imported, but not used. Oh, huh. because we're being a bit stupid. <sighs> okay, so. We also use the variable name go as uh, apparently you can declare a variable and overwrite something that is sort of already defined. Um, yeah, okay, that looks better. So we're gonna run this now. Uh, we're just gonna say sudo blah -de blah make again. And here we go. Uh, it didn't work. So why didn't this work? Um, I would guess that there is a typo, we forgot something. Uh, let's just make sure the program has been compiled. So we have hello. Hello has been compiled at 1812. Um, that is, okay, let's just say make hello. Oh, heh. smart. So yeah, um, that's because it's just a shitty make file. Okay. Uh, much better. So yeah, we're gonna run this again. It was just not compiled. So yeah, here we go. This is our slash proc slash CPU info file now. And it's the very same thing that we also saw with the Rust program because we're just, you know, reading out the same file. Anyway, so that worked. Um, and now we have a setup that we can use to run anything arbitrary in Docker over CPU on our RISC-V platform. Now, I also told you that most people would actually just run, you know, Docker run something um, and then pull something from a Docker registry. So uh, we could technically also do this now, uh, but we would need to make a bit of a change because we need to have our CPU command present in the Docker container that we want to run. And we do this by deriving from an existing image and then copying CPU over into it. So what I could do now is I could use the uh, Docker file that we currently have um, and make an adjustment. So instead of inheriting from the, uh, just from scratch, 
right? So instead of using the empty image, I can use some existing image. Um, now let's see if there is actually anything out there that we can use right away. So um, how do we search for this? This could be a bit hard now because when I say risk five uh, Docker image images, I I'm not sure actually how this works. So this, yeah, <laughs> also brings you uh, again to the same person who also created the repository I want to contribute to. Um, now here is something nice. It says risk five Docker images, uh, risk five emulator Docker image. I don't know what that would mean uh, because for the architecture, it shouldn't matter if it's um, emulated or not. A pre-configured QEMU and Debian risk five image. Uh, that sounds a bit odd. But yeah, whatever. Let's use this here for now. Um, Risk five Docker images in this repository. Okay. There is base, EOSIS. Okay. Uh, that's a heavy tool, which uh, we will probably not need. Um, sudo, yeah, you don't really need this. So yeah, just don't escalate privileges to the root user. Don't do this. Just use your own user and assign yourself to a group that is uh, inheriting some privileges and that's all you need. Um, anyway, so yeah, they made a script apparently, which we're also not going to need. Um, right, so yeah, this is apparently what we're gonna find here. So let's look at Docker Hub, uh, UCB bar risk five Docker images updated four years ago. So it's not too recent. Uh, but it might still work. Oh, look. Uh, yeah. They're taking Yosis from here. Um, that website no longer exists, as you can see. Uh, this is really fairly outdated. Um, yeah, the Docker files used to create these images are in the UCB bar GitHub repository, uh, which is interesting. So we can actually have a look at that, right? So there is this, well, they were saying they had a base image, right? So they're saying from base latest. Now, which is the base image? I guess it's just in here, Docker file. Oh, wow, OpenJ, okay. Um, I think we're running into the uh, wrong thing here and this is not really what we're looking for. So I don't want to run Java or do something with the JDK. Um, no, no, I just want an image uh, which has risk five binaries in it. So what else? There is this here. Um, it's also called risk five. Now the problem is you don't know if these are now binaries for risk five or tools for risk five or whatever. Yeah, this is also including some QMU with risk five support. Oh, wow. Um, Docker file can be found here. What do we have here? Uh, a bunch of things. Linux, I don't know why we, we would need Linux because we're running in Docker, right? So we're using the host kernel. And this here is a bunch of things we're also not gonna need. Um, no, that is also extremely outdated. So can we find something um, comparable? So there is, like besides the x86 architecture, there is a bunch more, right? So there is ARM, there is MIPS, now we have RISC-V. And so I don't actually know how this works on Docker or Docker Hub actually. There needs to be, uh, there needs to be some way of telling uh, whether an image is actually made for your architecture. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense or is there an implication? So does Docker implicitly just say, okay, I'm going to pull images for your host architecture. It could technically do that. Um, I don't even know how that works. I really have genuinely no idea. Container that can build risk five tests. Okay. It's a, again, it's something that is building something for risk five. 
what we're not looking for. Uh, this looks quite empty. Risk V toolchain. Yeah, we have Risk V toolchains. We don't need that. Okay, so um, does Docker Hub have something like documentation? Let's see. Doc, 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 human, doc, you developers. Getting started. Open source. Docs. This might be what we're looking for. What can we have? Okay. Architecture. Docker overview. No. <laughs> okay. The word architecture is also a bit um, <laughs> too general. So, of course, Docker also has some architecture within it, but we're looking for an instruction set architecture. Instruction set architecture. Leverage multi CPU architecture support. Okay, that looks better. Multi arc support on Docker. De no, we don't need Docker Desktop. I don't even know what build X is. Um, Build and run a multi-architecture images. Okay, that looks promising. Docker build X, really? It's like, could be like a cross compile tool. So X is sometimes used for, you know, because it looks like a cross for, <laughs> cross something. Um, there's other tools also with X. Um, yeah. For more information about the build x CLI command, see build x and the docker build x command line reference. Can we actually just run this? Or do we need to install this? Uh, let's see. So when I say docker build x, uh, oh, that actually exists. Okay, so we can say bake, build from a file, uh, build, start. I don't know what the difference is. I guess we will find this out here in the uh, documentation. So ls would just list all the builders. Okay, I don't know what a builder here is now. To be honest, it was easier to write something from scratch because I had just done this in like no time. Ah, uh, ls. Yeah, this is why. Okay. So it says MD64 and 386. Duh. Okay, how do we get this to include something else? Create a new builder which gives access to the new multi architecture features. Okay. I would need to give it a name. Oh, wow, this looks horrendously complicated. To be honest, also today, my experience with Docker was also very complicated. So I wanted to install Docker. So what would I usually do in my distro? I would just say package manager, install Docker, right? Um, turns out that's not how they distribute it. So they have their own, um, they have their own repository, which I had to add. So by the way, if you're having some trouble reading this, I would just enlarge this a bit. So yeah, they, they want you to do this here, uninstall something old if you already had it, um, you know, add some new GPG keys, uh, curl pipe into sudo, which you should never really do, especially not if you're working in a corporate environment because you don't want to compromise your entire uh, environment, right? So that's literally not a good idea to do. Um, this is like the YOLO of the internet. Uh, and because it's so horrendously uh, stupid, somebody made this beautiful tool. It's called YOLO.sh, um, which really is made for curl pipe into, you know, YOLO script hosting service. So here you find all those stupid scripts like some script. Uh, you, you can just post it there and somebody else can just curl pipe sudo bash it and voila. This is how you gain remote codes execution by just, uh, you know, social engineering. You tell people, hey, I put a script there. You can just run it and it just works. 
and well you're not telling them what it's running and well it can just download malware or whatever um, and then just move laterally across your corporate network uh, compromise everything um, I heard that Twilio got fi uh, fished recently and that's uh, you know been used by signal for uh, I think for like uh, verifying when you sign up or something and this is one way of how this happens besides email of course uh, but yeah it, it can be the mechanism and email would be like you know the means of communication anyway so yeah that was very frustrating um, now we're going to look at this here again um, yeah sorry if I'm ranting a bit here um, I, I really expected this here to be much, much more convenient. Okay, so apparently um, you can also do this. Okay, so why do we need to create a builder? I guess that it's just for convenience and you can actually just say this here, build dash dash platform and then you're building for multiple plat. Hang on. If you run this then, how does Docker know what platform you're running on? Dash dash platform flag informs build X to generate Linux images for AMD 64 bit uh, and so on. So that's what is being passed here. That is clear to me. Now, if you want to run this, how does Docker know? Um, how does Docker distinguish that? Huh. Can you? Can you say docker run dash dash platform? Does that work? Let's look at the manual. Uh, run. So docker run, let's search for platform. Plat okay, now platform here, Ar archi architecture, search, no, no architecture here. Huh. Can I specify the architecture in the docker file itself? So uh, essentially I want to I want to simply compose together an image for us now without, you know, I don't know, jumping through burning hoops here, bending over backwards. Uh, so how does, how did this start? So we're saying we're using build X. Okay. Create a new builder. can also run docker build x create dash use okay what is the difference switch it using a single uh, okay how do we do it otherwise do we say docker build x use i don't see that here oh yeah that's down here now okay so we would switch to the new builder inspect i don't care i don't want to even bootstrap anything uh Oh, we would need to create a builder for the other architecture. Okay. Um, why isn't there just a defined set of builders for, I don't know what. Huh. Okay. Um, can I extend my, like if there is, if there is this default thing, let's have a look at this again. So our default builder says it's for those, right? Can I extend the builder? Can I say, can I say build X, docker build X? Can I say add an architecture? Uh, it doesn't have a manual by itself. There is create, there is inspect. Docker build X. 
uh, create, use, remove, prune, huh. Okay, let's say we inspect default. It lists the platforms. Okay. Can I say... Mm. Can I do this here now, just right away and extend the existing thing? So if I were to do this, would it be Linux slash RISC-564? Or would I need to say RISC-564, IMA, FD, whatever? Let's see what happens. Um, RISC-5, or maybe it's RVCC4, IMA, FD, C. Uh-oh. Oh. oh, okay. I would need a Docker file for it. Huh. That's a bit strange. Whatever. Let's just see if we, if we can use the one that we currently have. Um, well, it did something. It finished. Let's inspect. Huh. Now this is interesting. We're still seeing the same platforms. I'm getting more confused by this, to be honest. I mean, we, we have an image, now, right? We didn't give it a tag, so the only reference is this here. Uh, so we, we get the hash now. So yeah, the, the tag would be like an alias to this. Um, and to be honest, I'm also not the hugest of experts when it comes to Docker. So this is why I'm struggling with this now. Um, yeah, so this here is essentially doing the very same thing uh, that I also did uh, when I just ran docker build uh, like what I have in the make file. Huh. This is getting much more complicated than I actually intended it to be. Um, so let's do the following experiment. So I, uh, I think I made a directory for this the projects the okay let's make a directory called dockery um now i will i will just uh, write a very small docker file which is uh, you know common for uh, node.js node.js app docker file dockerizing a node.js web app bloody bloody blah we actually don't need the app we just want to have the docker file so this is the docker file right so i just doing this here vim docker file no we're gonna we're gonna use neovim um yeah we're gonna call the file index.js and we're not gonna do anything we're not gonna npm install or whatever uh we just copy dot slash index dot js here uh not 16 uh Almost. We're gonna use node 18, um, and instead of index.js, oh, we don't need to expose the port. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just gonna write a small index.js file. Uh, we're not going to do anything meaningful. We're just gonna say console info, uh, or we're gonna write like I don't know, risk five. That's it. So I can run this file, right? So I can just say node index.js and it will print risk five. Okay. 
So now I want to um, docker build x this file for the RIS 564 IMA FDC platform. I don't even know how that is evaluated. I would actually like to see if I pass something nonsense here, like this here is definitely not a platform. Will it work? Um, no. So yeah, I don't know what exactly an LLB definition is. Uh, something manifest, whatever, not found. Um, so yeah, let's see if it works when I pass R. Okay, that doesn't work either. Huh. No match for platform. And okay, now the, now we're talking. So instead of RV64, I'm a FTC. Um, we're gonna say RV64 GC. That doesn't work. Uh, how about how about? Uh, this is a bit nuts because every tool has a different idea of this. I would say risk 564. Okay, that doesn't work. I would just say risk five. Doesn't work either. So yeah, in, in Go, okay? So when I want to build something for risk five in Go, I say Go arg equals risk 564. I tried risk five, that doesn't work. It needs to be risk 564. So I need to specify the end in this, which makes sense actually. Um, when I build for um, when I build with Rust, how how do I do this with Rust? So when I say cargo build, I would specify the plan. No, I would specify release and then target. I would specify this tuple, right? So I would say risk five sixty four GC, um, just like I tried above here. I said RV sixty five. Maybe let's try risk five sixty four. Uh, sixty four. Uh, that would say unknown Linux GNU, um, and that would just work in Rust. So what does Docker want? Do they want RISC-564 GC? No. Huh. Maybe it's also that there is no node 18 image for it. So, I mean, Okay, this here is Ubuntu, so I have a horrendously outdated version, version 12. So 18 has been out for a few months now. Node.js releases, if you look at this table here, uh, this is their um, you know, support lifetime table. Uh, version 18 is the current version that's been released in April. Why do I, Ubuntu, I'm running Ubuntu 22, Oh, 04 the same you know release as this year why do i have a version which is already not even just out of date it's already end of life and it's so much end of life it's not even listed here um where do i have node it's in user bin node so i don't know app cache search node node.js or node uh -huh. Wow. Um, node, node M project, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Okay, that's why I actually don't really like Ubuntu that much. Um, I guess this is what I have installed, right? DPKG, Node.js, yeah, that's what I have installed. Um, version 12, I don't understand this. Anyway, so yeah, anyway, let's try 16. Um, so what are we gonna run? We're gonna run sudo bloody bloody blah. Okay, no node 16 for us either. So um, what we're now gonna do is we're gonna try to find out what plans for uh, what platforms you can actually specify or how. So it just says dash dash platform, but it doesn't say where you find the platforms, does it? Build X, command line reference. Maybe we find it in there. Variety of, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Other than AMD 64, it's horrible. So the x86 or AMD 64, the 64 bit variant uh, architectures are so, um, I'm not finding words for that now. 
um, yeah, you, you should really be aware of uh, different architectures out there. That's what we're looking at risk five in the first place, aren't we? So yeah, um, architectures other than MD64. Where is risk five? Some images have been ported for other architectures. Many of those, uh, these are officially supported to various degrees. Okay. Let's search for risk, risk. Oh, great. That's what we wanted to see. So it's risk 564. Okay, maybe I can just, oh, look at this. Okay, we're gonna use, which one do we use? Busybox or Alpine? Um, Alpine is actually very nice, but apparently Busybox is a bit more popular. It's also very tiny, so I will just use this here. So when I want to derive from this, what do I do? Uh, I will just say from this here, right? There is also the UCLIPC variant. I don't know what they use by default, probably muscle. I don't know, I don't care actually. Okay, so uh, Docker file. So we're going to say from risk 564 so, oh, do they actually have Node.js here? That would be awesome. Tags, filter, node. No node for us here. Overview, you can search for uh, existing images. Huh. Oh, wait, we're in Busybox here now. Okay, we want to see everything that we can find under risk 564. Do we have, I guess this is everything. Yeah, 707 repositories. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to have something like RabbitMQ here now or something huge and bloated like Debian or Ubuntu. So yeah, let's, let's really just use Busybox. Well, there is also Hello World, but I mean, we already have a Hello World, right? So we want a rich environment now. So we're gonna do Busybox. Um, Okay, actually what we're gonna do is, uh, we're going to copy uh, what I already set up here, uh, x86 to risk five Docker file. We're gonna copy that here. And instead of saying from scratch, we're going to say from risk 564 busybox, um, our command will be uh, sh, Um, so yeah, for, for this here, we don't need to put the architecture here because that's not, not how this is set up. We don't need to specify the architecture. So what do we do? Um, we specify the namespace. Do we need to specify? Uh, we would probably be missing shared library. So we're not gonna, um, we're not going to do this here. Uh, but this is unfortunately what we still need to do. Um, oh, right. So we still need a shell. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but instead of putting that in um, slash bin directly, uh, we're going to put this in slash bin slash CPU. So we're going to have to adjust a few paths. Uh, what else? Yeah, we, we don't need our hello app here. We're going to need the keys. And uh, we will need to make an adjustment to the cpu.sh script. So cpu, actually cpu everything goes here. Uh, we're going to copy over the libraries. And now let's say, yeah, we don't care about the namespace. Uh, we're just going to run a command. Um, yeah, that's what we ca uh, still can specify dynamically. Namespace, oh, wait. Uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna leave out the namespace. Okay, so we just passed the key, the timeout, um, the CPU node, 
and the command. So again, the Docker file, we are going to run the sh command and the sh command would be from that would be in slash bin, right? Hang on, what was our CPU SH script? Doesn't know anything. Ah, okay, yeah, this is actually, right. So slash bin SH, that's how it works. Um, yeah, this is what we're going to pass down again. Okay, now let's copy over the uh, make file. So we don't need to compile our hello program. We don't need this here. Uh, yeah, I have this prepare thing. So I will copy a slash bin slash dash whatever to a sage. Um, yeah, I wanted to get to this point here where we copy a go toolchain into the container image, but I guess we're not going to have enough time for that today. Um, Anyway, uh, this should now be it. Um, uh, let's just run make and see what happens. But we're going to have to use this here. Oh, right. Do we actually need this build X? I'm, I'm not convinced that we actually need it. Let's, let's just see what happens if we derive from. So yeah, this should be totally sufficient. Okay, so um, yeah, SH doesn't exist because I hadn't run the make prepare thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now the CPU.sh script has not been copied over. Why? Uh, CPU.sh. CPU.sh is here. Successfully built. Oh. Yeah, I mean, this is okay. This is just a warning. Exec slash CPU uh, So instead of slash bin sh, um, we are, oh, hang on. This here is overriding the sh. So this is not what we want to do. Um, oh, wait. We need to say slash bin slash cpu dot sh and also slash bin slash cpu. See what we did here. Ta-da! Here we go. It worked. So what can we do now? Let's say you name. What does you name give us? Well, um, we're hoping to see something now. Like, uh, I don't know, Linux on RISC five something. <laughs> uh oh, that seems to be stuck. But it did work. Okay, so this is a bit unfortunate. Um, now let's do some debugging. So I still have the uh, USB serial attached here. Um, I think I would just need to turn it on, uh, but we can say minicom. It might be that the kernel already panicked or something for reasons. I don't know. So yeah, let, let's see if the board is still responding. So when we say ping vision five, does it respond? It does. Okay. Uh, kill all Docker. Like for real Docker. Okay, let's do something different. Let's run the ls command. That does not seem to work either. Okay, this is a bit um, sad right now. And um, 
To be honest, I'm not really sure what the problem is right now. So this is something to figure out for next time um, so that we have something to pick up. And yeah, otherwise we will see. Maybe we uh, get a reply from uh, Vision 5 by next week. Maybe I was ranting too much and the karma is just biting us. Um, but yeah, technically uh, we already made it into a shell. Right, so we're running bin sh here. So we could say echo high. That could technically work, but it doesn't. So, okay, for, for one last experiment, let's do the following. Um, instead of the sh command, uh, let's run the ls command and see if we get a directory listing. Okay, so we're gonna go to the uh, dockery here. let's see if we get output yes we actually do we actually do now interestingly um, this is not our namespace oh wait uh, can we I don't want to see slash. I want to see, well, okay. We, we see the root first. So we see the root, right? So yeah, this is technically okay. Um, I want to see, oh, let's see if there is something in slash Etsy that we only would expect from BusyBox. Do we have something in slash Etsy which is specific to BusyBox? Um, there is something like hosts, local time. How would you know that you have BusyBox running? Well, um, it would mean that we have something in slash bin, which is called BB, right? Let's see if that's the case. So in, in BusyBox, it's like in Uroot. Um, that's actually what we got the inspiration from. There is a binary called BB, which is just containing all the other binaries and then everything is just assembling to it. Oh, and look at this here. Um, that looks, that looks very, very busy boxy to me. Um, so yeah, we do have our busy box here. Awesome. It's just that the shell didn't work, but yeah, that, that could be uh, whatever specific reasons. Um, let's say, oh, look, there is an editor in there, a VI, good old VI. So we could even use that. Yeah, that actually works. Um, what is the best indicator to see that we have BusyBox? I can run strings slash bin slash bb. Pipe that um, into, now this is coming uh, from uroot again, right? So yeah, we're, we're running this command here, slash bin slash bb. This is from the bin namespace that we're mounting over from BusyBox. Um, so th that's the implicit namespace. So if you don't specify anything, by default, you would just have bin um, lib, lib64 or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about uh, the default one, but at least you have bin and lib. So, you know, you can use your binaries and shared libraries. Um, at the slash home directory. Um, uh, what would we have if we uh, look at the strings and we grab for like busybox? I guess we would have to say insensitive. Let's just grab for busy. That should work. 
Uh, yeah, it's just that our, um, okay, let's, let's just use grab. Uh, let's just use bin grab. So this is pro this is now going to be the busy box bin. Um, yeah. Oh, invalid option I, <laughs> but we actually do get something from BusyBox, right? So this is now, this is now an error message from BusyBox itself. Um, and it's telling us how the strings command works. Why does, why does it give us the usage of strings now? I don't know. Because the dash I is here for BusyBox. I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. No, I really have no idea what happened here. Uh, one, once again, I mean, we, we can do this, right? So we can also just run the command like this and then let's search for busybox in whatever we get for the output. So we should get the strings of slash bin slash bb now in a bit. Seems like it's not really returning us anything. Uh, why does it say no such file directory? Isn't there a, we have listed the directory. Isn't there a, oh. Ah, okay. I guess in BusyBox is not called. It's not called BB. It's okay. It's BusyBox. And we say bin BusyBox. Aha! Uh -huh. And here we go. We see the strings of the BusyBox binary. Um, yeah, which is as I said, you know, just all the binaries that we have and yeah so you you find tons of strings in here um and that includes of course references to busybox like copyright you know command information and so on all right so that worked tremendously good so okay let's um let's recap a bit uh what we've done today so i uh, will go back to the issue that we looked at that i created here uh, in risk five, bring up. Um, we are running the CPU daemon on the vision five board. Um, we just directly boot into it, right? It's running a Linux boot image. It's coming from the network and then we can CPU into it. And so this time we put the CPU binary in a Docker image, which is actually made for the RISC-V platform. And so what we can do now is on our host, we just run Docker as we usually would. And then we say CPU, then our CPU node that we want to use, it's now the Vision 5 board. So we're using its IP address and then we're running our command for which we used one of the, um, you know, simple hello world tools uh, out there, um, which I just modified a bit. Um, and after, you know, do, doing that, so that was a, an image built from scratch. Uh, then we pulled an actual image from Docker Hub from the RISC-V org, um, which contains a busy box environment. And so now what you can do is you can use everything that is in there. And of course, um, so we, we haven't done this now, but it would also take too much time. You could also just say you derive from, let's say Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, then you install additional packages there, um, like whatever you need, or you just use Alpine, you know, something rather small. Um, you could install something like Node.js and run that and run your favorite binary. So yeah, that is something that we could do next time. I think I will not uh, look deeper into why the uh, shell wasn't running or maybe it was and um, yeah, 
I, I don't I don't know what happened. It could be something to do with input output streams or you know whatever. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure right now. Um, yeah, I will, I will see in the uh, CPU channel and the open source firmware Slack. Maybe we can figure this out. Um, if not, then yeah, I, w I won't bother too much right now uh, because we achieved our goal, right? So we run we were running uh, Docker image over CPU. Yeah. So yeah, with that. Thank you very, very much, and I hope to see you next time. Um, and then we're going to explore a bit more and hopefully get back to our CSRs, um, for which I've already also prepared something else, uh, which I had uh, briefly mentioned uh, in a previous stream. Um, so yeah, now you have something to look forward to and think about. And with that, bye-bye.